appreciate everybody taking the time this afternoon to be here with us virtually. Uh, this is kind of a new format for, um, I think, all of our governments and all of our community uh, as we continue to navigate um, what is, you know, an emergency, um, state of emergency that we're dealing with here, uh, both in our uh, county, in our region, but also in our nation and globally. So we appreciate everybody for taking the time to connect with us virtually. Um, this is a, an important topic about temporary care centers here um, uh, locally in the Pierce County area. Uh, this is the first temporary care center um, that will be set up here in the Tacoma Pierce County region. Um, I wanted to just again thank everybody for being here. Hopefully you and your family and your loved ones are safe and healthy uh, during the stay home, stay safe uh, order um, that has been uh, put in place by our governor to protect uh, public health and safety. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is our first virtual town hall, so please um, have some grace and, and patience with us as we work through any kind of bugs that come up. Obviously, we're all kind of in our homes. I'm here in my, my home office here in Southeast Tacoma, not far from the Temporary Care Center at 84th and Hosmer. Um, you know, so just uh, beware that we could have noises or sounds or, you know, people's calls could drop off. So just um, please be patient with us as we work through some of those issues. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. This um, event will be recorded. Uh, this is going to be posted to the City of Tacoma's uh, YouTube. Um, we'll be linked there uh, for folks to watch afterwards in case you want to come back and watch it again, um, or if folks uh, weren't able to participate here at 5.30 and they want to um, uh, come back and, and watch it later as a pre-record, um, this will be available for that purpose. So there are some benefits to using this technology in that regard. Um, so we are here again, as I mentioned, uh, to talk uh, a little bit about there is going to be a panel discussion tonight. Uh, largely led by our County Health Department Director, Anthony Chen. There's a number of different panelists here uh, from both the county government and uh, the city government and county emergency management. This is obviously a joint effort to try to get some communication out to the community uh, regarding temporary care centers uh, as we continue to, to move forward. Obviously, the community is under incredible pressure um, in responding to this emergency, and these facilities are critical care facilities uh, to help relieve the pressure on our hospital systems to allow people to isolate and quarantine and recover in a safe space. Um, so this is these are very important facilities, but obviously there are new. And I think when we've sent out the communication uh, previously, there's been quite a few questions, and that's why uh, some of the elected leadership here in the county, um, including uh, County Council Member Marty Campbell, uh, fellow City Council Member Catherine Ushka, uh, who serves as the chair of the Board of Health, uh, are on the call, as well as folks from our, our health department and our county emergency management. So we'll be hearing from uh, the subject matter experts tonight, as well as our elected leadership on these facilities. Um, I can say that I, I did a, a personal tour along with the other elected leadership in this county, including the mayor, the county executive, um, as well as the other two electeds on this phone call with me. Um, and I'm very confident that this facility is going to serve the community well, is gonna be well managed and is going to run smoothly. Um, I feel very confident in that after having gone through the facility and, and seen the operation and have some of the questions that you've relayed to me and relayed to other elected officials that, that we've heard. Um, and I think we'll hear that stuff tonight. Uh, we'll hear that feedback again tonight. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand off the microphone at this point to Councilmember Catherine Ushka. She represents District Number 4 um, in the city, which is the South End and East Side. Again, she is also the chair of the Board of Health. Um, so she serves as an important role here in terms of leadership with our Department of Health. So um, again, thank you very much. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy and, and um, protected during this time. And uh, I hope that this town hall serves you well in getting your um, pressing questions and, and needs answered uh, regarding this facility. So I'm going to pass it over to Catherine Ishka now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Beal. I appreciate it. And thank you for hosting this town hall. Um, I want to personally welcome everybody that's on the call today. It is the concern and care and thoughtfulness of our community in times like this and in times that aren't like this that gives me the confidence to know that we're going to get through this together one way or another. And so thank you for being on the line tonight and for being interested in caring. Um, some of you are going to be listening to this right now and some of this are, some of you will be listening to this to a listening to this on a recording later on when it's uploaded to YouTube as uh, Councilmember Beal had mentioned. You know, uh, our health and well-being during this pandemic is very closely tied to the well-being of those that are most vulnerable in our community. Um, 
And it's important that we keep that in mind and we keep that perspective. The space of the center is going to create space outside of the medical health system that's going to give uh, space for people to get healthy uh, in a safe location uh, without infecting other people at the same time. So I'm, uh, I continue to be impressed with the hard work and really intense collaboration um, under the uh, leadership of the Emergency Management Center of Pierce County, uh, the City of Tacoma, and the Health Department. And I'm grateful to all of them for their hard work. Um, and I hope that you are too. Uh, and with all of that, it's now my privilege to introduce Pierce County Council Member Marty Campbell. Uh, he is the council member overseeing Council District Number 5, and the center is in his district. Thank you for being here, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Chair Eshka. Uh, and thank you, Councilmember Beal, for your work, leadership, helping get this brought together, and uh, Chair Eshka, your work on the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Uh, it's really times like this that we realize how important public health is, and we turn to our public health, health board and the professionals within the public health department uh, to lead us through difficult times. Just a little bit about this town hall. The goal of tonight's town hall is to address some of the primary concerns that have been elevated from across the community. Tonight, we're gonna to do our best to answer many of these questions as possible. Uh, we'll have some presentations from Dr. Uh, Chen. We might follow up with a few questions. Hopefully, we'll get all your questions answered, uh, but if not, there will be an opportunity after all that uh, for some, some additional questions. And I just wanna remind people, this is a fluid situation. Things are constantly changing. And so open and transparent com communication is our primary objective. We wanna let you know what we know, get out there you know, publicly, uh, put that out there, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I know personally, uh, so many times within the, uh, when we see investment in our community, particularly when it comes to health disparities, uh, we feel sometimes we're last. And this is a chance we get to be first. And so for that, I'm very excited about it. I know I've had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Chen and the health department about it. Um, so there's a lot to be excited about here. And hopefully after tonight, you'll see a lot of the great uh, things that are happening within that. And so I just wanna thank everyone who's tuning in, watching this uh, and, and really taking your time to help understand and be part of really what is historic moment here in Pierce County as we step forward to support our, our health agencies. Uh, so with that, let me uh, introduce Dr. Chen, who's the Director of Health at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. I've had the honor of working with him uh, for many years uh, and uh, watch him through this crisis where we are very lucky as a county to have him. Dr. Chen, please share with us. Thank you, Council Member Campbell, and thank you, Board Chair Pushka and Council Member Beal. Um, I just want to let everyone know that right now, um, well, something that you probably already know, uh, the COVID-19 coronavirus infection is quite widespread and continues to spread in our community. We have cases in every part of our county. As of today, we have 717 cases and unfortunately also 12 deaths. The temporary care centers, which we're going to talk about today, provide a safe and supported alternative for any Pierce County resident who for whatever reason cannot stay safely in their own homes so that they are not getting other people infected. So this could include people, for example, who live with an elderly parent, a, you know, a child who has asthma, someone who's immunocompromised, or you know, maybe their family works um, or their small children that their uh, family has to take care of, they wouldn't be able to take care of them. Um, maybe they have roommates who they don't want to inconvenience or who may not be um, real comfortable with them. Or these could be people living homeless or people who are ready to come from the hospital and don't have a good place to go. So the objective of these temporary care centers is twofold. One is for assessment. And um, let me explain some of the language that you will hear us use. So for assessment, we're talking about people who are in quarantine. These are people who are not currently sick, but they have been exposed um, and in close contact with someone with COVID-19. 
Now we want to continue to assess them, make sure they're doing okay. We want to see if they're going to get sick or not. But because we know sometimes they can start to shed virus before they are showing symptoms, we want them to stay out and away from the public for 14 days. So this certainly would be an opportunity if someone doesn't have a good place to go, that they could stay in the temporary care center. The other um, function that this will serve is for people who are in recovery. Um, so this is a situation where you'll hear us use the term isolation. Isolation is for people who are sick, they're tested positive for the virus, and you know, in this situation, it will be for people who are having mild illness. And just to remind you, we, we feel that at least 80% of people who get this illness will have mild illness. They'll, they're not going to need hospital care. But like people in quarantine, we want them to remain isolated so that while they are shedding virus, they're not spreading the disease to other people. We know that assessment and recovery are effective. And they, they are essential strategies so that we slow the spread of disease in the community and which will prevent people from getting sick and also will save lives. The temporary care center that we are talking about today will open very soon in South Tacoma at 84th and Hosmer. This has been a long planning process. Uh, the health department, Pierce County, the city of Tacoma, uh, many other partners, um, came, together, came together because we know that there is a need right now, and certainly if there are more cases that come along, there will be more uh, need in the future. I know the county executive is committed to making sure that there's access for any resident in Pierce County to have a place to go. Um, and conceptually, you know, something in East County, something in Central County, and something in West County. And as Council Member Campbell mentioned, um, this is going to be the first, and Tacoma is going to be leading the way. However, you know, this really belies a lot of the work that we've done with our partners in narrowing down different possible sites to, uh, to get to some of the best options. Many of the sites we looked at, and you know, the, the county looked at over 80, I think close to 100 sites, Many of the sites were places that the owners had volunteered to help the community by providing a site that could be used. And as Council Member Campbell mentioned, um, in addition to helping uh, those who don't have a safe place to go, it also, um, the temporary care centers will help the healthcare systems. And I know that I was speaking the other day with one of the medical um, directors at a local hospital and this was a couple weeks ago. And he said to me, um, right then he had, you know, six, seven, eight people who, who had gone better from COVID-19 and they were ready to be discharged, but he didn't have a good place for them to go. So when we opened this place, this would be a place where they could go and therefore, um, you know, allow the hospitals to open up and be available for the people who are sicker. So the way that this will work is that as part of this disease investigation, and certainly um, we will take referrals as well, for example, from the hospitals or, or maybe from family members um, or people directly, health department staff will identify people who should stay in a temporary care center. So this is a free service for the people who need isolation and quarantine and cannot do so at their own home. The Pierce County Department of Emergency Management will cover the cost for food, lodging, and other needs when they're using the care center. The property owners we have worked with have been very helpful partners as we work to provide this important resource to help our communities during this unprecedented public health emergency. As part of the process, uh, we have also engaged people who live and work in the area to hear what their concerns are. Um, and before we had done that, of course, we had worked with law enforcement, uh, fire, local elected officials to hear what their concerns were. So I just want everyone to know that this has been a very thoughtful um, planning process. Um, and we just want to make sure that not only um, is it going to work, but it's going to work well for the community. So um, to clarify, the center is going to be a place where people can stay voluntarily 
We hope people who use it will see this as a step to protect themselves from COVID-19. It is also the neighborly thing to do to reduce community spread of the disease. For the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, the health and well-being of all Pierce County residents is our priority. We thank everyone in the area for their consideration and understanding. Um, after this, um, this town hall meeting, we will also have, um, well, actually, I, it, it is available now um, if you want to look at that, but certainly after the meeting, feel free to go to the web page on our website. That's www.tpchd.org slash COVID-19 temp care. So that's tpchd, as in Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, .org slash COVID-19 T-E-M-P-C-A-R-E. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator. We're gonna take a couple questions from council members first, and then we'll move into a Q&A. Council member Beal. Thank you, Kenny, I appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Chin, uh, for the thorough presentation. Um, I think uh, the idea here with the panel is to ask a few um, of the commonly asked questions that I think we've already received from the community. Um, so hopefully that's okay. We're gonna walk through these. I've got a couple, we've assigned a couple of these um, questions that we've heard, commonly heard uh, feedback on uh, from the community and hopefully we can address uh, some of the bigger questions that have come up. Um, so the first one that I have, and, and then we'll, we'll kind of move down the line with um, Council Member Ushka and Council Member McCarthy, or I'm sorry, um, Campbell. Um, so the first one that I have is how did we select the site? I know you mentioned um, a little bit of the criteria there, and I know that you know having a willing owner is part of that. Um, I know you'd mentioned that the geographies of East, West, and Central Pierce County, which I think is kind of the important point here that you guys are looking on a countywide basis and providing these services, right? And I think that the question that has come up is um, there's a tendency to feel like uh, Southeast Tacoma and the South End um, are sort of a dumping ground, I think is a term that I've used and or that I've heard used um, uh, coming into this town hall. I think um, one of the questions that has just come up is how did the site get selected? What, what were the criteria around it? And, um, you know, the facility looking for one, how did we narrow this down and, and how broadly did we search? Right, as I said, the um, the search started with between, I think, 80 and 100 potential sites. Um, there are a lot of different criteria we, we looked at. We wanted to make sure that there was space for it, that the facility itself had the right types of accommodations. If you think about it, hotel rooms are actually very good for this um, in the sense that each room is self-contained. Right there, each, each room has a, a bathroom. Typically they have their own heating and ventilation system. We actually do use hotels in other situations. So um, sometimes when we need to find lodging for a patient with TB, tuberculosis, which is another um, you know, respiratory infection, we will house people in um, hotels or motels. Um, typically hotels also have laundry services. They, they have some kind of food um, handling services. So um, these are actually really good places to um, be looking at. Now, especially um, if you have a larger hotel um, and this particular facility has lots of space, um, we also can't, I mean, they're, they're just physical separation. So they're wings, they're floors to the hotel. This makes it easy for us, for example, if we get a group of patients who come in who got sick about the same time, we can try and keep them to a certain part of the hotel. Um, you know, we, we, so there are lots of really good things about hotels in terms of the, um, the you know, the, the amenities that they offer. Oh, and by the way, you know, they, all, they now all have Wi-Fi, they all have free, you know, TV, whatever movie channels you want. So if we're asking someone to stay in their room for two weeks or, or, or less, that, you know, that they have what they need. Um, we also looked at things like transportation. So if, you, you know, anyone who knows this site knows it's very accessible, you know, um, great transportation access. 
We also know that it's fairly close to our hospitals. It's um, if someone either needs to come from a hospital because they're being discharged, as I mentioned earlier, or if we find that someone who is in isolation or quarantine is getting sick enough, they need medical care uh, in a hospital, then we can transport them easily. So there are uh, quite a few criteria um, that we went through, um, narrowed it down, and then of course, um, the team went out and visited each of these sites. Some of the sites we thought would work well turned out not to work well. Um, and then, um, of course, you know, checked with the owners again, uh, checked with elected officials, made sure concerns from law enforcement, fire, um, and you know, other um, community partners were addressed. Um, so, yeah, uh, quite, quite a long process. Thank you for that, Dr. Chen, and, and I can appreciate that process. And I think when, um, when this first came up, you know, one of my first reactions, I think, was the same as, you know, the community that I represent, the community I live in, is just, how did we get to this spot? And so it sounds like you, you went through a long, uh, thoughtful process in, in trying to find some of those locations, um, and, and particularly locations where you do have an owner uh, that wants to help. And I think that that's an important point. Um, I know I have uh, spoken to the owner and um, he definitely has um, a heart for these things. And I think a lot of the folks in the community have the same feelings of compassion for you know, our friends and neighbors that are sick. Um, also, I just wanna say that the facility is well accommodated. I mean, it's a very, very nice um, motel facility. We, we did get a tour at safe distances from each other, obviously, um, just this weekend. And just reminds me, I've been in the motel once before, but you know, the remodel, it's a very nice facility. People are very well accommodated. And I guess that kind of dovetails into my next question is, what type of services are gonna be available to folks that are staying in the temporary care center? And what kind of services will the guests receive? I, I know one of the questions has been, what if they're not provided with um, their needs or people feel like they've gotta leave the motel for something that they need? How are people accommodated so that they are sort of incented to stay at the facility um, during their recovery time? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. And, you, you know, I think it's important to recognize that this is not, once people check in, it's not like a regular hotel where normally guests could go on and off property. Uh, it, it's not quite the Hotel California, but once you check in, you have to stay there for the duration of the time you need to be there. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for us to have people coming in and then decide they're going to go out and you know spread their virus you know in, unintentionally, right? So, um, and as part of the planning, we just need to make sure people's needs are taken care of. I mentioned earlier we're going to have on-site laundry, um, and then if there's any cleanup, we have you know cleaning and biohazard cleaning uh, capacity. People will be provided three meals a day um, if they need basic over-the-counter medication, like if they're running a fever and need some Tylenol, um, they're you know, coughing or sneezing and need some cough syrup or some medication, we'll provide that. As I mentioned earlier, um, one of the very nice things with hotels, they're already wired for Wi-Fi, they have TVs, they are landline phones if they need to, um, you know, for example, if, if they don't have a cell phone and someone needs to reach them or they need to reach someone, uh, the, we will have uh, ability to, uh, for those who are interested, stream, you know, religious services. Um, we also have reading materials that they want. Um, in addition to that, I know that in our conversations with our um, governmental partners, it was very important that we had on-site security. Um, and in a minute, I might turn to Trent Stevens and have him fill in some details on that. But we, uh, oh, and, and you know, the, there will be a team on site and they will have um, some capacity to do medical evaluation. So at least a nurse and some other assistants. Um, and then we would be able to, you know, call for transportation if someone needs to go get additional care. But let me just introduce Trent. He has been a key leader in our um, planning for this whole process and he's still smiling through the whole process. But Trent, why don't you introduce yourself and um, unmute your microphone. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, my name is Trent Stevens. I work for the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. I'm uh, helping out with this as part of Pierce County Emergency Management Team uh, to help develop these sites and it's been a great pleasure to do so. 
So Dr. Chen talked a little bit about security. So um, what we've done is I uh, want to make sure that the people, the residents who are, are there are safe and secure, as well as our community. So we've already contracted out with have um, security on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also, when we first start up, we'll have law enforcement on site to help um, with any needs, urgent needs right away. Um, and then assess that as we go along to see if we need that as we go. Site is completely fenced all the way around, and we have one way in and one way out through a uh, fence, a gated fence. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Trent, and thank you, Dr. Chen. I, I I'm really appreciative of um, the answers to both of those questions. I think those are really key, and I and I appreciate Trent. Um, he was the one who sort of escorted us through uh, the site the other day. I can say that. The security, the security is, is well um, established already. I was already intercepted by the time I tried to enter the site, and I think that that's going to be um, something that's key to um, answering some of the folks' questions about whether people are able to just come and go or people able to visit, and that's a very clear no. W would you say that's true, Trent? That's correct. Um, so while we're not going to be able to hold people against their will, we're going to encourage them to stay there as much as possible. Um, we want people to stay there, so that's why we're trying to provide as many services as possible that we can. Um, and if somebody does decide they want to walk away, we're going to encourage them as much as we can to do that. But we'll, and when they do, we'll make sure the health department knows that the person's walking away, as well as local law enforcement and uh, the fire department know that this person uh, walked off. Well, thank you, Trent. So um, next, I'm going to uh, pass uh, off the microphone, uh, the virtual microphone, to um, my counterpart, Catherine Ushka, who's the, the again the board chair of the health department. Um, her tremendous leadership on the health board. I think um, she can help us guide us through a couple more of these questions that I think have come up. So, Catherine, take it away. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Um, real quick, before I ask that question, in my opening comments, I meant to make sure that I acknowledged that the mayor of the city of Tacoma and my colleagues are also interested in paying attention that wasn't feasible to, or, or reasonable to have them all on this call. But just so that you know, um, it's not just Chris and I from council that are leaning in and paying attention, it is the whole council. Um, with that in mind, another question that's received uh, quite frequently is what's the difference really between temporary care centers and temporary expansion shelters? Councilmember uh, Ushka, thank you for asking that question. Uh, what we're talking today about are temporary care centers. So these are places where people can go, uh, where they can be safe and supported while they observe isolation and quarantine. There's a separate conversation going on in that um, for the people living homeless, as you know, there are very few facilities for them in Pierce County. Just to give you an idea, um, my understanding is the Tacoma Rescue Mission can typically hold about 150, 160 people a night. However, if they were to observe the social distancing that we are encouraging right now, that capacity would be cut to about 50. So you may be um, aware that um, they have made an arrangement with Bellman um, to allow um, some of their usual clients to stay over there in the gymnasium. Um, however, we also need some um, facilities that have a little bit more um, services. So, for example, if someone were sick with um, COVID-19, we, we may want to have them isolated. You know, someone who is, uh, I mean, we've had cases in both the Nativity House and at the rescue mission. Um, and we want them to be able to be isolated or quarantined. So we are looking for resources for people living homeless. Now, some of them may be using this temporary care center, but we also recognize that some of the people living homeless have some um, challenges, right? So not everyone, but some of them have um, severe mental illness or they may be struggling with a substance use disorder. And so people who work in the shelters typically are very skilled in managing those challenges. Um, so we do want to have some more specialized centers that will um, be catering to that population and that would be uh, primarily working with the existing um, shelters and the um, agencies that work with 
um, people living homeless. Thank you. And just for clarification, this is a temporary care center, and that is for people to um, take the time to do whatever quarantine that they that is necessary, regardless of whether they're housed or not housed. And so that'll be a mixed population. And temporary expansion shelters are really intended as an expansion of existing shelters to make sure that social distances can be maintained even in um, homeless shelter situations. Is that accurate? That's exactly. Okay, thank you. Another question that um, is commonly asked is what the policy will be at the care center for whether or not visitors will be allowed. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, you know, the whole point of this is to allow people to separate themselves from the public. Um, so we do not want visitors and visitors will not be allowed at the center. Thank you for that, Dr. Chen. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the virtual mic to Council Member Campbell, who's gonna follow with the next question. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Chair Ashka. Um, I also want to, uh, uh, like you acknowledge that uh, the county executive uh, has been very engaged in this and um, I'm certain that I have uh, a fellow member of the county council uh, watching this. We're gonna watch it later and because uh, we're looking at how this could be across our entire county. So this is uh, a start, but it really is a countywide issue. This will support the entire county. Uh, we're just fortunate uh, that for once starting with us. So pretty excited about that. Um, and also just remind people, this is a great time. Yeah, I got a couple, uh, hopefully quick, brief questions. So uh, if you have some questions that you've been thinking about, don't quite feel like they've been answered, go ahead and you know start typing those in so that we can have them uh, ready for uh, uh, kind of a public Q&A. Um, and the, the hard part about going last here is all the good questions get asked. Um, and so I just wanna, um, I, I think these have been touched on, but I, I just, it's the, the questions that we've been getting a lot. So I just wanna, reinforce it so that we're clear. Um, and this can be, you know, uh, Dr. Chen or uh, Trent, you can uh, weigh in on this if you wish, you know, but more specifically, uh, what measures are in place to protect those who live or work in the area around where this care center is going? So if you've been to the site, you know there's just some physical distance from anything else. I, I mean, you have to cross the road to get to the businesses on the other side. Um, and then, you know, on the other side, you've got the freeway. So there is already physical distance. There's good air movement in that area. Um, we do not expect that um, there will be transmission from this site. Um, as you know, the reason that we recommend the six foot social distancing is because this infection tends to be transmitted by droplets when people cough or sneeze. And, and um, Someone very smart figured that that takes about six feet or less. Um, so the people staying in the temporary care center are expected to stay in their rooms. Uh, we're not, uh, we're telling them they shouldn't be out of their rooms, except for, you know, some very unusual situations. Um, and so we do not anticipate there to be a significant risk to um, you know, people or businesses in that area. There's just physical distance, the way the ventilation um, and layout of that facility are, I, I don't really anticipate that to be an issue. Trent, do you want to add anything to that? No, you say it very well, Dr. Chen. So yeah, so the site's very great, is a great place for it because it uh, has three roads on, um, on all the way around it. It's separated from the community as best we could. Um, and it's just a great uh, overall spot that we could figure out for best to serve our entire community, the entire county. Okay, thank you, Trent. Uh, um, and, you know, some of the concern is, you know, this being in the community and Dr. Trent, I think you touched on, I've been out there, the buildings, you know, it's isolated, surrounded by freeway on one side, major road on another, and uh, a whole parking lot around it. So it's not actually connected to any additional buildings um, if, if someone wanted to leave the temporary care center uh, against, public health, against public health advice, uh, can they? So, as I said, this is a voluntary site. Um, 
we have staff on site. If someone wants to leave, they would talk with this person. But let me just give you, you know, uh, analogy here because I mentioned earlier we sometimes will do this for people who have TB or tuberculosis. Um, and I've been here 11 years. I've never had to sign a health order compelling someone to stay in isolation. Usually when we say we're going to offer you a place, we're going to feed you, you know, three times a day, um, whatever you need, we'll get for you. I don't think we've ever had anyone insist that they need to leave. Um, but in addition to that, you know, as I said, we are going to have a, a, a medical team on site. So they can address medical concerns. They, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a confrontational thing where we call in security or law enforcement. Um, they can talk to the uh, resident. Um, you know, they'll have some ability. I mean, they'll, they'll have understanding of people's needs and, um, you, you know, it, and be able to talk them down. They have those skills. Um, so we do not ex anticipate this being a problem. Um, but, you know, the, we feel that these soft barriers, uh, you know, and we have several soft barriers, right? I mean, obviously, we will have our medical team on site, and then with security, and then with law enforcement. Um, but we really don't anticipate we're going to have to throw handcuffs on any, I, I mean, that is not the point of this. This is to help people. Um, I would anticipate that everyone who comes there is, is going there because they have a need. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that they, they don't want to get their, you know, elderly parents sick, or they, you know, are living in a situation where it would inconvenience their roommates. So, so they have reasons why they want to be there. So I don't think anticipate this to be a problem. Thank you. And uh, just one more question as you're kind of framing it, and I think we touched on it, uh, but just kind of, I, I don't know if we touched on how people arrive and, and leave there as much. So are people going to see a line of cars lining up? Are people going to be walking up to it? Uh, when they're discharged, are they just walking away? Are they just grabbing a cab? What, what's that going to look like, the coming and going of the individuals who are staying in the care center? So I just want to remind you, all the people coming there are going to have to be screened through the health department, right? So it's not something we uh, want people to come up and knock on the, the chain link fence and you know want to get in. But in terms of the logistics of the transportation, I'm going to turn that over to Trent. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yes, you're correct. So we're going to have uh, everybody screen through the health department and refer to us. And once we've done that, we're going to arrange transportation by either a private contracted transportation vehicle or by ambulance depends on where they are and what kind of transportation needs they need um, and once they become on site we'll know they're coming they'll be transported one at a time they'll be met by our medical staff and then they'll be uh, allowed to go to the room and then once the time's up we will pick them up and do the exact reverse take them where they need to go when they're done either back to home back to pre-arranged place something like that but we'll take care of their needs and from the location, no problem. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sounds like you guys got a good plan for identifying the, the people through a medical facility, bringing them in, taking care of them while they're there, and then getting them back uh, to their home, wherever it may be across the county. Um, so with that, uh, I'm just going to thank you for that. Uh, encourage people, go ahead, submit your questions, and I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Hey everybody, this is Kenny Coble from the City of Tacoma, and we have some questions that have come from y'all that will go to Dr. Chen and the panel. If you have your own question, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and that will get directed right to me so I can know what to ask Dr. Chen. Um, Dr. Chen, your first question is, is the health department collecting and willing to share demographic data on who has been tested, diagnosed, and hospitalized with COVID? How will the community know if disparities will be reinforced during COVID? So we have to be sensitive in terms of what data we can release. Um, currently on our website, every day by 2 p.m., we will post the numbers of the positive tests and um, deaths in the county. We also have an interactive map if people want to see uh, 
which part of the county they live in, how many cases there have been there. Um, one of the challenges, and, and if you look at the map, you'll see that it, it's not by city or town per se, right? Because there, we do have areas in the county where there are small populations and last thing we need is someone trying to speculate who in the community has the illness. So the um, areas on the interactive map um, go down to about 20,000, know, anything below 20,000 population, we don't call it out. Um, right now, we are not breaking out the um, race and ethnicity of people. Again, our numbers um, are relatively low in that regards, um, but that is something that uh, we will, you know, we can, um, I will pass on to my staff about whether we should be doing that. Um, but I do want to assure the public, it's not just the health department, um, but the county, um, everyone that's been involved in this has been very acutely aware about the equity um, and disparities issue. Um, if you think about it, um, it, it, it's not a, I mean, it's fairly intuitive that the people who currently uh, suffer the greatest inequities are also the ones that are most likely to have bad outcomes from this illness, right? I mean, um, those who already have poor health status because of the, the inequities in our community, whether it's where they live, um, you know, which part of town they live in, or um, you know, by nature of their race or ethnicity, those are the people who have the poorest access to health care. Um, they often have uh, many chronic illnesses. Same can be said of people who suffer from mental illness, who also, you know, they tend to die much younger. You know, people with severe mental illness tend to die much younger than people who don't have uh, severe mental illness because they have many comorbid um, health conditions, um, right? So everyone's already very acutely aware that those who have already suffered the worst inequities are also the ones who are most likely to have the bad outcomes. And because this doesn't discriminate, if we don't take care of that group of people, they're going to get everyone else infected as well, right? I mean, everyone could get infected in this situation. So I appreciate the question. I will um, ask my staff to see whether it's feasible for us to report um, racial ethnic data. But you have to remember that racial, when we talk about health disparities and health inequities, the biggest contributions to inequities is not racial ethnic. It's actually social, economic, and environmental factors. So, um, you know, both council member Bushka and Beal know their districts have not good health outcomes, right? They have some of the, the poor out outcomes and that's purely geographic and socioeconomic. Um, of course, there's also about overlap of racial, racial ethnic, but um, people shouldn't just focus on racial ethnic. If you look at our maps, it already gives you some idea of the distribution across the county. But thank you for the question. We will take a look and see what we can do about reporting some of the um, other factors without divulging too much, um, um, you know, protected health information. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Our next question from the audience is a two-parter. When will the temporary care site open and has it taken in patients yet? That's a question from Allison. So the temporary care centers um, have not opened yet. We expect them to open soon. Um, I, I know um, both uh, council member, well actually all three council members who are on the call were just visiting the site. Um, I, I saw Trent there this weekend. Um, it was very busy. There's a lot of preparation going on. Um, you know, if, if you haven't been by the site lately, as Trent mentioned, we now have a fence up around it. Um, there are trailers, there are, you know, all kinds of things now in the parking lot that were not there before. Um, inside the doors, we've been training. Um, if you remember, I said we're going to have teams on site. Um, so when I was there Sunday, they were doing a training of all the staff. Um, so that was a combination of health department, um, you know, agency contracted staff, um, all kinds of different staff. 
So a lot of stuff going on, but we, we are hoping that we can get this open soon because the need is out there already. Uh, you know, you may have heard, for example, um, that some of our um, social service agencies in the community already are paying for hotel vouchers for people to stay in hotels because they don't have a good place to stay. Uh, we hope that when this opens up, it will make things so much easier for uh, both the people who need to use it as well as all our partners in the community. Thank you. Our next question is from John. Has the county done outreach to the surrounding community? And he wants you to know that regardless of what we think, people of all people, ethnic groups um, deserve to know. You're absolutely correct. Everyone deserves to know. I, I think, um, you know, I do want to highlight what I said earlier about why the community heard at the time it did, which is that there, there was a lot of planning and engagement at other levels we had to do before we could even talk to the community about it. Um, but we have been working with a lot of community partners. Um, you know, I know Safe Streets has been a, a very important partner in this. Um, I, I understand that we've also worked with the um, business association in the area. Uh, we have worked with all our elected officials, not just our city and county elected officials, but our state representatives, um, you know, our, our legislators, as well as our congressional delegation have all been involved. And it wasn't just to inform them. I mean, we specifically had to ask of them to say, we need you to go engage your social networks, right? It's not just, it's not a one-way message from the health department or the county to the community. We wanted to hear from the, count, uh, from the residents in this area about what their concerns were. Very much as when we talked with the elected officials in, at each of these sites, it, it was hearing from them what they were concerned about. They often would give us some um, intelligence about the needs of that area or what the characteristics were of that area. So um, Trent, I know that's not your area because I think there was a different part of our incident command structure during the community engagement, but um, did I leave anything out, Trent? I mean, I, I know there was quite an effort and Council Member Deal, I know you were very involved in, in a lot of that. Did I leave anything out? I don't believe so, Dr. Chen. We've tried to reach out as best I know for a lot of people to be aware of this uh, part of it. And just for my part regarding translation, we're making sure the staff and everybody's aware whose English is a second language, we're making sure they're trained, prepared using that. So we're taking in you know, our, uh, our population who we work with in that as well. If we take any people who are coming in as residents, we're gonna take care of any translation needs that they, they, um, they have. Thank you, Trent. We only have a few more questions left, so if people have more, please send them to me through the Q&A button. Dr. Chen, this next one is um, a, a little off topic, but I still think you might know the answer. Um, do you know why the numbers for JBLM are no longer being shared? And do we have them? Right, so um, this was a decision that I understand the Department of Defense made so it not only impacts us and JBLM, but also impacts Kitsap and the Naval Station there. Um, my understanding is that um, they felt that there was a national security reason why they did not want to report that. Um, their, their numbers are small. Um, you know, it's a decision that they made. And so they're no longer um, being reported in our numbers. Thank you. All right, this is a question um, directly to Council Member Campbell. Oh, it's a little off topic as well. Um, from Jason, when do we expect to see a county budget projection presentation similar to the one presented at the Tacoma City Council last Friday? Jason, great. Uh, thank you. Great question. We're actually working on that. I think tomorrow we'll be having study study sessions looking at uh, what our uh, county budget's looking like. Um, the city's in their biennial budget. They're in the second year. 
winding that down, starting up to a new budgeting process. We just passed our budget last November, so we still got a lot of room in that, uh, waiting for the projections to come in. A lot of projections are gonna be coming similar from the state level on down, and we're already looking at what we can begin doing to move stuff along and delay stuff to the second year, to make sure that we have capacity uh, throughout the year. So a lot of that will be starting at uh, tomorrow's study session, and we have a meeting tomorrow at three, and then I think we'll actually have some special study sessions over the next couple of weeks. Uh, part of it is we wanna make sure that we're both getting on this early and making changes to our budget early, but not moving so quickly without getting all the data coming in. So thank you very much, great question. Um, if anyone has an answer to this question um, from Bill, it's not quite on topic, but I think it's an important question. Um, asking, why does Governor Inslee insist on having a scheduled date to lift the stay at home order, which is currently May 4th? Um, this question, uh, Bill believes it would be better to have no scheduled date and just say the order remains in effect until further notice to minimize the danger of false hopes and expectations. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Well, um, let me give it a stab. I, I obviously cannot read the governor's mind, but you know, I can see that there is value to help people plan. I know that some people were hoping that the order would be lifted sooner. Um, so this gives it gives a clear message that it's not going to be sooner. Right? I, I think that we have some um, good experts up at University of Washington who are doing projections on when they think this will peak, and um, and then even after the peak of cases, we're going to need to wait a little bit of time to let it come down from the peak. Um, I, I, you know, the. Earlier number we had heard regarding school closures at the end of April, that was entirely because um, the OSPI knew that um, with spring breaks, the last spring break ended on right around April 26. So that was a good time for parents to be to at least have in their head about when they should um, be doing that. Um, and then with the governor extending it. Um, you know, the, it, it allows people to plan. So, of course, what you're seeing is that at every point, the governor's going to be working with the Department of Health to look at what's going on with the hospital admissions, the number of cases, the number of deaths, to see whether we can, um, you know, relax some of these restrictions. I think one of the other things that we're starting to plan for and the Department of Health is starting to plan for is how do we ease that? So the other day I was talking with the county executive and he, he made the analogy that when, when we had to very quickly implement these um, restrictions, it was like flipping the lights. All of a sudden, you know, these businesses were closed. We, we weren't supposed to go out and so on and so forth. And as we ease it, we don't want to flip the switch back up because if we all of a sudden, everyone stopped social distancing and went around did everything they used to, they're going to expose people again. So if you want to extend the analogy, how are we going to turn the dimmer back up, right? To go from the switch being off to, you know, gradually a little bit more, and then what's the next notch? What's, you know, so we don't know exactly how we're going to do that. We're, we're working on the planning, but I think it does help people to have a time frame. Um, you, you know, certainly, certainly for the kids, it, I mean, some, some of the kids have a hard time waiting till 10 minutes later, right? But um, you, you know, hopefully adults can wait longer than that, but it, it's still important for people to be able to have in their mind um, that they can expect that um, they're going to have to, you know, undergo these restrictions for this amount of time. Um, and then that, that gives those of us who need to plan for the transition also a time frame that we need to have something that we can tell the public or have information to inform the policymakers as to when we, you know, turn up the dimmer or lift the restrictions. Thank you, Dr. Chen. We have two more questions, and then I'm going to invite county and council members and you um, to share any final thoughts. I'll give you maybe one or two minutes each. Um, so the last, second to last question um, from Jay says, 
the area is full of folks who are suffering with drugs and street workers and a lot of homelessness. How do we keep them safe? I might, well, I, I, I'm trying to figure out what the questions mean. Are they talking about how do we keep the people in the care centers safe? Or are we talking about the people in the community who are suffering from these conditions? Uh, if, it's in, if we're talking about how do we keep the residents of the temporary care center safe, I think you heard Trent earlier describe the, the steps we've taken. Uh, there really is only one point of access to that property now that it's fenced off. Uh, we will have security, we will have law enforcement, at least in the beginning, until we understand what the needs are. Um, and in terms of their um, you know, medical needs, or if any of the people who are staying in the center are people who are suffering from substance abuse, um, you know, we will have services available for them. But in terms of the people who are not in the temporary care center, uh, that's probably something which our council members can address better. If I can jump in here a little bit. Um, we did discuss this a little bit while we were on the tour, and I appreciate the question. I think that the question, and I, I wish the commenter could let me know if I'm right or not, um, is more about the people that are in the surrounding area and if people leave the care center who could have, um, it could still be infectious. Um, who aren't housed, how are we protecting them? And I'm gonna refer back to some of the discussion that we've had already about how carefully ingress and egress is monitored. Um, as uh, council member Beale and I uh, toured the center with appropriate social distance, this is one of the questions that we also asked. And because people are, the answer that we received is that because people are in there for X many days, and it's not a sentence, it's the best medical practice based on when they were exposed and if they, when they last had symptoms, et cetera. If somebody has been in there for 10 out of 11 days, it's not gonna be that big of a concern from a, um, a public health perspective. But if somebody's choosing to leave and walk away and not take transportation back and they're infectious, that's something that uh, Mr. Turner and Dr. Chen and public health will monitor and track, just like they would anybody else in the community who's actively has the virus to make sure that we know what who, who's in contact and, and how to protect it. I, I felt pretty confident, I'm gonna to look to my colleagues to, to nod their heads or not, that the way that they have this system set up, it's, it's pretty well organized. I, I, don't, I don't expect that people will just wander off into the community and I think that that's a good question to ask and it's one that I want you to know that all of, all of us here have also asked and feel pretty comfortable that the community will be reasonably safe out of the limits that we have right now. And thank you, Chair Eska, and I'll just reaffirm that. And I think we brought it up in our questioning. Basically, uh, people will be at a hospital, get an ambulance, come here, be dropped off, and again, be taken away back to where they need to go. So um, we really, given the way it's set up and give, really just given the way that it functions, be very little interaction um, but if any, I don't actually anticipate any interaction between anyone who's staying in the care center being cared for and the surrounding community. Um, so I think that the, not just the physical barriers, but just the way the operations work, it's just going to be a, it's a very own separate kind of insulated uh, entity. Thank you. I said we had only one more question left, but then someone snuck in a good one. So I'm gonna ask them both. Um, the next one is, um, how is the temporary care center being paid for? So um, if, if you remember the county executive did sign an emergency order and um, while that sounds kind of scary, the main purpose we do emergency orders is um, not the, the um, you know, the impact per se on the community, but it allows government to move very quickly when it needs to expend money um, and, and, you know, execute contracts and so on. So currently, um, my understanding is the um, county is paying for this. Um, we expect that this will be reimbursed in the future. Um, and 
you know, I'm not sure if Council Member Campbell has any uh, has been has been involved in any other conversations, but this is something that we need to get done. Um, as I mentioned, the the need is there, um, and we anticipate there will be more need in coming days. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, you covered it very, very briefly there. The county is covering the cost on it. We've been working very closely with FEMA every step of the way of, is this a type of project that if we do it this way, is that something that you will reimburse and getting direction from them to make sure we're doing the right things to make sure that we are reimbursable. Um, Trent, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, correct. So uh, I know the process is making sure we have an application process through the state, through FEMA. Um, we made sure that we had authorization, prior authorization through FEMA before we went through any of this stuff, uh, these steps. Um, and so the county executive is very confident talking with him. Emergency management is as well. Um, I, I think we're really confident that uh, we've done everything we've done in our part uh, as far as getting reimbursed for what we were together. All right, thanks everybody. And here's our last question, and then I'll invite council members and Dr. Chen to share closing statements if they'd like. So our last question comes from Patty. What resources will be available to individuals once they are well enough to leave the center? Will there be community follow-up, example, visiting nurses and things like that? So, when people leave the center, we anticipate that, you know, those who were in isolation because they had the illness, we expect that they will be well enough to leave. Um, whereas people who are in quarantine because they were exposed, we will have found out whether they're going to get sick and then, then they would become an isolation case. And, you know, of course they stay there until they get better. Or if they did not get sick, then they're free to go um, back to where they were before. Uh, and typically in both of those situations, there would not be a whole lot of follow-up needed. Of course, we would assess what's going on. Um, you can imagine some of these may have um, other you know, medical issues that would need follow-up on. That's part of the function of the team to make sure that you know, we make those arrangements for them and to help make sure that they're um, going to be, um, you know, getting their needs met. Um, one other situation, which I didn't mention, is that if someone were to get sick, you know, sick enough they needed to go to the hospital, um, we've, I've already discussed this with the hospitals. They, they're both eager, well, one of the things they appreciate about having this, in addition to what I mentioned earlier about as a, lo a location where they can discharge patients who can safely go there, one of the things they would appreciate about this is that uh, we would have on-site, um, you know, some medical or nursing assessment. And if that someone needs to go to the hospital, then we can contact the emergency room um, or the hospital directly and you know, for example, they could get directly admitted to the hospital instead of having to go sit in the ER and get evaluated, right? So they're, they're, uh, in that particular situation, there, there are some clear advantages for us having this. But in terms of the, the majority of people that we anticipate will be there, uh, you know, just to, you know, get better, recover from their um, illness or complete their assessment period to make sure that they're not going to be infectious from a exposure. We don't anticipate there to be a whole lot of follow-up, but certainly the benefit of having our team there is that we can help do any that follow-up if necessary. All right, thank you, Dr. Chen. And I'm gonna invite folks to give a final comment. We'll start with Council Member Beal, if you have anything to say. Well, thank you, Kenny. And um, I just wanted to extend my uh, appreciation and, and uh, gratitude to the panel here tonight. Um, thanks for getting on the phone with the community. Um, I think at some point we had close to 70 participants um, on the phone uh, here virtually. So uh, this was, I think, uh, very, very useful and instructive as to how this facility is going to work. Um, again, you know, the, the, the tremendous need for this critical care type of facility cannot be understated. You know, the, the, the public health professionals and medical health industry 
um, all agree that we need these. They're becoming commonplace acro across the country. Um, I think that uh, you know, some of the operational things, um, I definitely feel a lot more confident in how the facility is going to operate with professional nurse nursing staff, controlled entry, um, professional security staff to keep the site and the community safe um, from this uh, you know, terrible virus. Um, but this critical care facility is part of this entire continuum of health healthcare, um, of our social contract with each other and having to stay here, you know, in our, in our houses uh, to help uh, slow the spread and, and, you know, flatten the curve. Um, these facilities are going to continue to be key. We're going to continue to see more of them. Um, I think as uh, Dr. Chin mentioned, there are a couple more contemplated here in the county, uh, somewhere on the east side of the county and somewhere on the west side of the county. Um, but this is going to be the first care facility. And I, I feel pretty confident after gone, going through the tour and having my questions answered. Um, Trent was more than accommodating to answer every question that um, the mayor and Councilmember Member Oshka and I had the day we were there. Um, I feel a lot more confident, uh, if I didn't already feel confident, um, enough in the, the operation of our professional staff with our health um, our healthcare system, uh, as well as the folks at our um, health department. Um, under the leadership of Dr. Chen, I think we're in safe hands. We're in really good hands when it comes to this facility. Um, and again, I feel really confident that this is going to work out pretty well. Um, I'm committed to making sure that we have transparency with the community um, as to how the operation is going. I know that the South End Neighborhood Council and the Southeast Tacoma Neighborhood Alliance is very interested in that. And so um, I'm committing to the community to continue to follow up and communicate what we know about the facility, how things are going. And I know Trent um, has committed to, uh, you know, making sure that we're checking the assumptions that we put in place when we opened it and continuing to adapt to make sure that this facility operates the way that um, it's being advertised and the way that we know is going to be best for the community. So um, again, I think we're in good hands um, and I appreciate everybody's time here tonight. Um, hopefully you're, again, you're, you're staying at home and staying healthy and, and keeping safe social distances when you have to go out just for the essential services only. Um, we are not, you know, past the, the flattening of the curve yet. And so we've really got to continue to uh, stay committed to this process and the things that our, our public health professionals and the governor and um, our other leadership in the county and the state are setting out for us because we will beat this, um, but we've got to continue to stay strong and these facilities are critical to that, um, to that effort. So. Um, I'm going to pass off the virtual mic over to uh, Councilmember Ushka. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Beal. I appreciate that. Um, I want to underscore the value of our public health system and all the people in emergency operations and how hard they're working um, to make sure that we have the information that we need. I mean, our, our, our curve is, is more flattening for a reason, and it's because we've behaved differently than people in other places of, of the world. At least that's what we believe. And I, and I say that question mark of that's what we believe because all of us have been experiencing this constant rate of change. We're living in a world that none of us have ever experienced before and using the best information that we have every given minute to make the best, most informed decision. And the rate of change has been phenomenal. Um, and people deal with it differently. And, and I say that to you because I'm gonna ask you to not just wash your hands with your, your favorite song and keep social distancing and uh, lean into the facts and figures, but to please treat everybody that you meet with compassion. You don't know where they are in this and to treat yourself with compassion as we go through this. Um, it's a little bit surreal for a lot of us. Some days are really slow-mo and some days go a million miles an hour. Um, and that's, and we're just gonna keep informing people and doing the best we can almost Everything that we talked about tonight, by the way, is on the frequently asked questions page at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department COVID-19 page. And it might be coronavirus um, page, but somebody will correct me before we're done here. Um, if you have not already gone to that page and checked it out, please do. It's probably one of the best in the nation in terms of the clarity and the layout of the information. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the chair of the health department. I had nothing to do with its production. I'm just glad it's there. Um, when you call in and, and ask questions, those call center staff are making sure that those FAQs are getting updated. I tell you that because again, there's things that we said tonight that might be different tomorrow. And I'm not saying that as a huge insecurity, we don't expect it, but go back to that page, um, sign up for their blog so that you can get the most current up, uh, information as we go along. And um, as an elected official that's used to talking to my community in person, 
uh, we want to hear from you. So whether it's health related or not, reach out to us if you have other needs. You know, there's things about jobs and food banks and everything else, and we don't know what we're missing. So don't hesitate to call on us if there's ways that you think we might be able to help and, we, and know that we're here to do our best that we can for you. Um, and sorry for that probably longer than brief uh, remarks, but thank you for the, the time to do it. And thank you all of you for joining the call. Thank you, Council Member Ashka. Council Member Campbell, will you share with the group? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Ashka. Uh, uh, first of all, again, thanks, Kenny. Thank you for your uh, great moderation here, making sure that uh, we had the outreach here. Um, and to Tanisha Jumpa, behind the scenes, making things happen. Uh, actually, uh, there's a whole lot of behind the scenes people, so I'm not gonna mention any more because I'll leave more out than are involved. You know, it's not just a few people, it's a whole community working on this. Um, because we're all in it together. And it, it really is uh, un, unprecedented. It's something that we haven't done before. And I am uh, amazed and proud of how the Tacoma Pierce County community has come together on this. And we hear about uh, sometimes not some great outcomes, people being prejudiced against uh, uh, perhaps because of ethnic origin. And that's just unacceptable. You know, this virus is just something that, that doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't discriminate. It, it is equal opportunity. It's, it's hitting everyone very hard. And we need to make sure that if someone has it, they're someone who needs that compassion and help. And they need our help. We need to come together to get them through it. And then as a community, get us all through it. So thank you all for joining in tonight. I hope we answered most of your questions. If not, go on the Tacoma Pierce County uh, Health Department website um, or you know, Kenny, uh, you, I know you put your email up there. Uh, you can reach out to him, you can reach out to any of us individually. We're, we're here at our computers in our home offices all day. So if you want to uh, reach out to us, feel free. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, council member. Uh, before I pass it on to Dr. Chen, I just wanna say thank you from the city of Tacoma, from Pierce County and from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Thank you to everyone who was part of this um, call. We appreciate having all of you on our Zoom meeting, our very first virtual town hall. And uh, yes, definitely go to the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department's website if you have more questions. Um, there are a lot of answers there. And like the council member said, you're welcome to email me if you have any feedback about this town hall. So thank you very much. Um, Dr. Chen, will you give your closing statements and then just send everybody off? Thanks for being part of this, everybody. I just want to echo, you know, my thanks for everyone in the community pitching in to do this. It's everything from people staying at home, washing their hands, you know, covering their cough, to our partners um, like Trent, who are in the Emergency Operations Center with us, to our healthcare partners who are on the front lines dealing with um, some of the sickest people in the community. Um, to the operators and staff in our nursing and long-term care facilities who are working really hard to try and take care of a, a very vulnerable population. Um, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. The, uh, the temporary care center is a very important step for us to move forward, but there are lots of other things that we are working on now. and. Um, the health department could not do this without the help of all our partners and all of you. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Trent. I know I thanked you the other day, but um, you know, Trent, I think, represents all our other partners in the Emergency Operations Center. Um, and certainly thank you to the city of Tacoma and uh, Pierce County for helping lead many of the, uh, much of this work. Um, but of course, we know that all the other cities and towns in the county are very supportive of this. Um, and I look forward to continue to work with all of you and all of you rest and as we um, figure out, out our way through this pandemic. Thank you.